Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Digital Health and Wearables series. I have another magnificent guest for you and the leader today. But before I go ahead, make sure you subscribe to this great content, share with your communities in healthcare, and let me acknowledge our partners, uh, our content partner Fujifilm, uh, innovators in healthcare, Salesforce, leaders in healthcare and life sciences, and Spirit Digital. But without further ado, I'm extremely excited to introduce you to Claudia Pagliari. She is the director of Global eHealth at the University of Edinburgh. Claudia, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good to be here. Uh, thanks for taking the time and being here with us. I've been following some of your uh, great work. So we're going to go straight to the questions. Is that okay with you? Yes. Brilliant. So the first question that I have for you is, what are the ethics and governance considerations to be aware of with regards to digital health? Thank you. Well, there are many of these uh, digital health, as you know, is a very complex area with different applications, different user groups, uh, different innovations, some of which are established and have difficulties, some of which are emerging and also are presenting new challenges. So ethics is really central to this process. And um, we've unpicked it in a number of different ways. And I'll share a few of those with you first of all. So you've asked about the ethics and governance considerations. And perhaps I will start with discussing the governance issues, which are important here. Um, they mainly have to do with data, of course, but also other digital things, digital processes. Um, so governance can be unpacked in various ways, for example, data management, behavior management, and policies. So issues around the management of data relate not only to the security and confidentiality of personal information, but also the quality of data. Poor quality data can lead to mistakes, which can lead to errors, which may cause harm or can skew the provision of services. And these can be very unethical, of course. So we, we sometimes forget that when we are thinking purely about issues like privacy, for example. But those are obviously critical. In terms of behavior, I prefer to think of this in terms of the concept of good governance, which relates to the ethical and responsible exercise of public and corporate duties in a way that serves the client, the citizen, or the patient. So weak governance includes the lack of organizational structures, effective leadership, or institutional checks and balances, which are necessary for avoiding the misuse of data and ensuring stakeholder trust. In the pandemic, we've seen governments wrestle with this, such as in the debates over contact tracing apps and digital vaccine passports, as well as in the use of big data. And some of the other ethical considerations, aside from the data, although that's always present, relate to technologies, applications, and practices. And they include things like accessibility and inclusion. Uh, very important. And ethical design. So designing in ethical ways, people often don't think of design as being an ethical consideration, but it is very imp important. Uh, for example, avoiding the use of dark patterns in cookie consents and data requests so that we're not manipulating people into giving consent when they may not be fully aware of what they're consenting to. Also, designing interventions in a way that they use the minimum viable digital complexity so that they can be used by people with cheaper phones or fewer digital skills, for example. Without good user-centered design, we're creating barriers to the translation of potentially useful innovations into practice and outcomes. Now, the so-called digital divide is manifested in the health sector in a way that's similar to the so-called inverse care law. Those people who are most in need of these interventions may also be in the worst position to get them, uh, and, and, they, and, and, and this is a problem. And we've recently been considering how this relates to the use of data. Um, arguably, there's also an inverse privacy law to the extent that people who may be least able to take steps to protect their information 
may also be those about whom the most information is being shared, such as people with multiple care needs, refugees, those in the social care system, or people who've had encounters with law enforcement. And of course, raising skills is very important here too. So one area I've been thinking about in this respect recently is primary care. Many governments, including in the UK, have used the pandemic as an excuse to push forward a digital first philosophy. And whilst this has benefits and obviously is taking us forward into the 21st century, we need to exercise caution for various reasons to do with a loss of uh, engagement, empathy, ability to pick up on symptoms that might not be possible to see on a video call, for example. And critically, as, because we might be excluding people like the elderly who don't have access to these technologies. So caution is absolutely needed there. And we also have in this context as well, ethically, is in terms of ethics and governance, many unanswered questions about the role of corporations in the use of personal data. And many of those are also being helpful in the sense that they might be designing new innovations that we might use. For example, there's evidence to show that many health apps are leaking personal data to ad tech companies like Google. At the same time, such companies are also playing a greater role in healthcare delivery, providing software, cloud hosting services, and even moving into care provision. Examples where this can go wrong include the infamous Project Nightingale, exposed a couple of years ago, where unencrypted personal patient data found its way onto the desktop of Google employees. And as companies like Amazon move into healthcare provision, we'll see have more to fear from, uh, particularly given their links with retailing, nudge, nudge advertising, and potentially things like insurance. And we also have other areas where the intersection between the consumer digital health world and the state-sponsored digital health world are, are creating slightly different propositions. For example, we, we are able to critique and have much more governance, I think, in terms of state-sponsored approaches, but perhaps less is known on the consumer market sometimes. And one example is consumer genetics, which is, has become a great form of entertainment for many people, finding out where their families are from or uh, uh, trying to, uh, in some cases, look for their health risks. Uh, and there are governance black spots here. For example, it's becoming common for law enforcement agencies to interrogate genealogy databases to identify criminals. Uh, and that's how they call the San Francisco Bay Killer, for example. And in this space, governments and quasi-governmental institutions are also playing a role. Uh, organizations that are collecting data at scale, like Genomics England, for example, or others. And I think the other issues for us probably in terms of ethics, and there are many, as I said, I've mentioned cybersecurity, of course, which is technical, but is also an ethical issue. But as we move into the use, the greater use of data and analytics for decision making, we run into a number of issues to do with the poor quality data I've mentioned before, but also the technologies and in the increasingly algorithms that are used to process this in order to make decisions or to sort patient groups according to their risks according to their ability to benefit from a certain intervention, for example, uh, and so forth. And of course, that's now merging into artificial intelligence as we, we automate more and more of these processes. And whilst that has some benefits in terms of uh, sustainable public services, for example, more autom automating things that were boring, repetitive, time-consuming, used a lot of human labor and were expensive, on the other hand, if we get it wrong, we could end up with a very unfair, biased, and potentially dangerous healthcare system. So that is a, a particular issue I think that we definitely need following up on in this regard. Sure. Well, it's so much there is a very fascinating, complex. Thank you so much for sharing this amazing insight and piece of expertise. When you, you started, with the quality of the data and the security. You know, I'm a fan of wearables. I mean, of course, they have these issues associated with it. But then you mentioned accessibility and privileged groups, digital skills, the LFAPs. The, is so, so much to consider. In the very end, you mentioned cybersecurity. Very recently, I interviewed a leader from a very large technology brand 
on cybersecurity in healthcare. And we see more and more leakages due to more and more data inefficiencies. So very complex. Claudia, thank you so much for that. The second and, and the last question that I have for you is, can you share some insights about your work with the digital health research, please? Um, yes, of course. Uh, it's again, it's a quite a diverse uh, area of research. It's been developing now for 20 years or so, really, starting with evaluating new health information systems, integrated healthcare systems. That's quite an interesting one. For example, one of my first projects many years ago was looking at an integrated uh, information management system for diabetes, for example, which was pretty much the first able to link records from different providers in order to create a better patient pathway, resolve difficulties with, uh, with inconsistent data and support patient care. Now, we've moved along 20 years later and we're still not getting that absolutely right. And that is a fascinating issue for, for me. Why not? Why not? We, we talk about it all the time. We're still stuck into multi-vendor multi systems. We've still got interoperability challenges. We still can't agree on standards uh, for interoperability and, and data. So we have somewhere to go. Things are improving, but it's a slow burner. Another one would be patient email. Again, been researching that for a long, long time. Uh, patient doctor email, we obviously use lots of other things like instant messaging and other things, video now. But doctor patient email is something that, again, in many countries like the UK, is still took ages, 20 years to be implemented. Patient access to health records, again, potentially fine doing work on that about 12, 15 years ago. Still, it's a problem for many organizers. So that those are as interesting as the emerging innovations. But on the emerging innovations front, I mean, I'm interested in things like robots, for example, and uh, particularly those that are uh, two dimensional and that include things like, um, you know, more emotional faces and more empathic design. Uh, so these robots can kind of understand you. They may be obviously physical, they may be virtual, then they're often being used for things like mental health. They may be useful in some ways because we often don't want to talk to a human being. We might be happier talking to an avatar or a, or a, a virtual agent, um, but they do create all sorts of challenges, not only in terms of our trust in people, in systems, do we, we start there's some evidence uh, from our research that they that people start to trust these things they start to imbue them with human characteristics and they start to rely on them and that reliance can be falsely placed particularly if it's just an algorithm you're speaking to and we'll see more of that and more of that as it's beginning to map our own faces digitize them and try to in some way respond in a more empathic and intelligent way to what we're doing may have some benefits particularly when we don't have enough healthcare staff we might find that's a sort of you know next best thing but it also leads to lots of questions about are are we being is this trustworthy are we being manipulated who is mining our, our information when we are actually not aware that we're giving away a signal that we are stressed or we're depressed or we're angry or we're sick for example because many times there's certain elements of your facial recognition that, 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 that suggest you might be ill in some way. So they would know before you know. So that those ethical challenges to do with innovation and trust and trustworthiness, I, I'm very passionately interested in. And whilst I see the benefits, I see also some risks. And probably the other area that's been most interesting in, in recent years actually is work on social media and the role of social media in healthcare. Uh, we've looked at it in very positive ways as well as not so positive ways. One very positive uh, way was a, a study I, I did with my PhD student, uh, Joanna Taylor, not that long ago, looking at uh, cancer trajectories and, and other trajectories of illness on social media. You can actually pick up how individuals approaching the end of life are expressing themselves and cross map that with the trajectories of disease that have been studied by medical researchers that had to do with things like you know, uh, pain, emotional uh, uh, anxiety, even uh, religious or uh, existential anxieties. Um, I actually see how, how that manifested, but also helpfully looking at how communities have engaged to support people 
often strangers, people that are strangers to them. They've got to know them, they've supported them, and they've created communities. And we've seen something very similar in asthma communities as well, who are, um, you know, actually designed communities, whereas a moderator, people coming together and sharing their own labor uh, to support one another. And it's not, it, we've not seen any evidence of it being toxic in the way that you're seeing in other fields. So there's some potential there, I, I, I believe, um, around uh, social media, um, mm -hmm. although also quite a lot of ethical challenges, as we've seen around health researchers mining social media data for their own research benefit. And some of them are ethical and some of them are not so ethical. And we don't quite understand the rules of the game yet. Oh, brilliant. Claudia, again, it's so much in there. It's so fascinating. I'm learning so much. But you mentioned, in other words, the robotics, the um, emerging technologies appearing for assisting living, maybe in early population. You know, all, all shapes and forms, these new things are appearing. So a lot of good, uh, interesting work there for you. But I like the social media bit, which is very controversial in a way, because is always like the reliability of the information and other things to consider. Thank you so much. Very fascinating. We could spend hours and hours just talking about one specific thing. But yeah, yeah. I think you gave a very, very broad overview about the issues, I mean, your work, but also the things to consider. Thank you so much. Uh, Claudia, I'm round up now. But uh, before I thank you for all your um, time and insights and expertise, I finish all my episodes in a peculiar way. It's not a question as such. It's called one minute of fame, okay? And you can talk about anything for a minute, uh, personal achievements, uh, family, uh, colleagues, uh, shout out to any companies, your work, anything whatsoever, over to you, one minute of fame. Ah, well, I didn't prepare for this. <laughs> Uh, and I, I am not a great believer in, in fame and uh, not doing this for fame. So uh, I might like to think of something else that occurred to me as a personal anecdote. And it was, I haven't got it to show you, but there was a, a discussion uh, online this week uh, around a, a Barbie doll being created of a famous scientist who, who, was, who was responsible for vaccine development. I think she's a British scientist. And they created a Barbie doll of this. And this has led to some debate over sexism. In, uh, and is this a good idea? Is this going to help girls to enter science? Uh, or is it going to stereotype them? It's quite interesting. It might work both ways. But while this uh, piece of, of news was circulating social media, I had a visit from my elderly father. And he brought some old photographs. And there was one of me, age two, with my favorite doll. And it was Batman. <laughs> <laughs> so I think yeah, maybe maybe that's uh, there's a lesson in there about uh, gender uh, and and science and and opening your mind to the <laughs> Claudia. Thank you so much. Let me personally thank you. Congratulate you on your great work. Uh, you've been doing great things and you still very 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 active. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your insights today. It's a pleasure. I'm going to round up now. Uh, make sure you uh, subscribe, but also connect with Claudia. I'm going to post Claudia's um, uh, social media here and LinkedIn. Ask her about her work, engage with her. Very interesting things there to talk about. And lastly, acknowledge our uh, partners. Make sure you check them out. Uh, the content partner, Fujifilm. The series uh, partner, Salesforce. And Spirit Digital. And I'll see you all next week.